Lori Houston's News for the Heart is dedicated to helping you give a voice to your own soul. Our hearts have the power to free us from pain and the struggles that keep us from awakening to our true essence. Join Lori now as we delve into our heart and soul to find the path that will open us to the possibilities and lead us to the life we love to live. And good afternoon. This is News for the Heart. Well, this is not the last Tuesday of the month. This is actually the second last Wednesday of the month because, well, we're getting into the Christmas holidays. So we wanted to get something out and not have to worry about it. I'm not sure when this is going to come out, but we're going to get it out as quickly as possible. Um, and because <laughs> we usually do a show on, you know, New Year's resolutions or what we like to call New Year's intentions we thought we would talk about you know what it what it means to have intentions and part of it is i'm going to talk a little bit because tom's going to get over his cough <laughs> but we'd start with you know part of it is getting clear and having you know going into meditation and knowing exactly what you want i always think of you know when we think of a new year, instead of having a whole list of things, try and come up with one to three. And something that we do over the entire year, so it's not something, you know, that we just do in January. <laughs> like resolutions often happen is that we get we get excited and then we start and then, we, you know, we fall back into old patterns. But intentions are a wee bit different. And we'll talk about that. But so we start with, you know, getting clear and having, you know, being in a meditative state, then releasing it. So whatever you decide to come up with, you release it. You have to stay present and centered and in the moment. And I guess kind of like our last show about, you know, the Christmas spirit, we could look at, you know, trying to come up with these things, maybe even start with one first and then move on, but having the tensions of what you want for the year, but, you know, thinking about them first thing in the morning, whatever. So you remain kind of centered and have a an awareness. Then you detach from the outcome and let the universe sort of take over. So I think Tom feels like he's back. <laughs> so welcome back, Tom. <laughs> hey, glad always, to be here. It's always right. good to have you. <laughs> well, I'd like to talk a little bit about the source of the intention because that is very important. Yes. You know, we have we have all sorts of intentions. Oh, I intend to lose 50 pounds. You know, oh, you know, I intended to be there on time. Sorry, <laughs> you know, we we have all sorts of intentions. True. And sometimes our intentions are are um, just to serve our ego, mm -hmm. to assuage guilt. You know, well, I really intend to make the human race better by eliminating all those people that I don't like. You know, that's <laughs> that's a good intention. I'm trying mm -hmm. to make the human race better. You see, of course, <laughs> I'll have to kill a few million people to do it, but you know, my intention is good. Mm -hmm. No, your intention is not good. <laughs> that's a terrible intention so intention doesn't just mean that you want something or that you think that you do something or even that you think you know you want something because you think it's good for everybody right. that's not the kind of intention that we're talking about here so there's intention and then there's intention you see and it depends on the source where's that coming from if that intention is serving your ego serving your fear, serving your arrogance, you know, if it's serving that part of you that's dysfunctional, then it's not a good intention. Even if you think you're only doing it to make the world a better place. <laughs> See? Okay. It's not making the world a better place. The reason you're really doing it is because you want control and power and force. And, you know, you want to rule the world. You want to be the one that you know, overrides everybody else's free will to make what you think is right happen. Well, that's just huge arrogance. That's where that intention is coming from. So the source of your intention is extremely important. Just intending to do good things and intending to help people is not enough. The intention has to come from a place of caring. Mm -hmm. 
yeah. from a place of love, from a place of what can I do to help? How can I be of service? What do I, you know, what uh, is the best thing to for me to do? What is the low path entropy, you know, the low entropy path for everyone? What can I do that will be the most help to the most people? And it's okay if you do things that are also helpful to you. It's not that you have to be entirely selfless and whatever. I mean, you taking care of you is an important thing. You know, you have to stay healthy. You, know, you have to get enough sleep. You have to, you know, do things. And that takes some attention of yours to do that. So it's not that you can't be concerned about yourself. But if if concern about yourself is the major part of your concern about anything, then that's a problem. Mm -hmm. That's called self-centeredness. And self-centeredness happens because of fear. Right. Uh, so intention is not such a simple concept. You know, it confuses people because they think, well, I just have to have intention. Well, you throw a penny in the wishing well, and then you hope for wealth or, you know, uh, that sort of thing. And that hardly ever comes true. So that intention doesn't work very well. It's not a very strong intention. But if the intention you have comes from a deeper place and you put a lot of energy toward it, a lot of your own, it's the willpower you put to it, that's what I mean by energy or put force into it. Your will has to really be serious about its intention. And the intention cannot be how to manipulate others better or what others can do. I intend for others to be a lot nicer to me. You know, that won't work. It has to be about you, about things that you can do differently, things that you can change, which means it's it's about you. And it's a, it's about how you are and how you act and how you interact with others, because that's really the only thing you can change. And it might be about how you eat, or you know the how you uh, get your social life, or. There may be all sorts of things that, that would come into your intention. <clears throat> but the intention needs to be heartfelt. That's another way of putting it. It needs to come from the core. It needs to have a lot of energy behind it, which means you need to be very sincere. And you have to really care. You see, it's not like you're asking for favors. I mean, sometimes people ask me, they says, well, is prayer and meditation the same thing? And well, that depends on what you're doing with your prayer and your meditation. They're similar in, in, a, in a sense, but a lot of times prayer is asking for, you know, asking for advantages, asking for boons. You know, oh, you know, dear Lord, let this happen, let that happen, don't let this other thing happen. It's like asking daddy for favors. Well, that is not strong. That does not generally work or, you know, come true because that's weak. It's coming out of the uh, I want, I want. It's coming out of your self-centeredness, what it is you want, yeah. out of your arrogance. So that doesn't work. But if the prayer is just something that you are really, you know, deeply feel that uh, you want to, you know, you want to give someone, you know, some peace and quiet and, and love. Well, then, yeah, it works as good as a meditation or anything. It's just a different form of meditation. And it's the same with the meditation. If you use your meditation for frivolous things, then the meditation isn't particularly useful. <laughs> it depends on what you do with it. What's, it's where does that intent come from? How serious is it? How important is it to you? Just like if you learn to use your mind to heal, if for you it's just a game to see whether or not you can do it or see how well you can do it, you won't be very good at it. But if you really care about that person, even though it's not anybody you know, it's just some name on a list. Mm -hmm. it's just, even though it's just a name on a list, you really care about that person that belongs to that name on the list. And if you don't really care about them, going through the motions isn't going to help them very much. You see, so it's different. There's, you can say, well, I intended that they got better, 
-hmm. but if it's superficial, it doesn't carry any power. Or let me put it this way. It's not that it carries zero power, but it carries very little power. Even a, a light intention carries a little power, but just not really enough to make much of a difference. It's very small. So you want a powerful intent. And you want it for a good reason, not just for, oh, this would make me feel better. And, and I would like this to happen because that's better for me. But it will work more powerfully if it's better for somebody else. Hmm. And as you say, if you can be detached, this intent. If you're attached, what the word attached implies is that your ego is attached. That's, the, that, that's what we mean when we say get detached. We mean don't have your ego involved in the process. Detach it from your ego. Detach it from anything other than you want to do something good for somebody. Now, that somebody can be yourself. <clears throat> you can use your intent to heal yourself. Most people don't do that very well because they can't get detached. Mm. If you can get detached to where when you look at yourself, if there's something wrong or some problem there, you just see it. And it's not like, oh, no, what's that? You see, that's, <clears throat> that's your fear. That's your ego. But you look at it just the same as you would if you looked at it in anybody else or somebody you didn't know. You can look at it dispassionately and work with it dispassionately. Now, dispassionate doesn't mean you don't care. <clears throat> right? We're talking about you have to care a lot. Dispassionate means you don't have any ego in it. So you see, it gets a little complicated around this idea of really what is an intention that we're the intention that we're talking about here. So if a lot of people say, well, I tried with an intent, but nothing happened, you know, it didn't work. Well, your intention probably was not very powerful. And it could have been not for the right reasons. It could have been a projection out of your ego or arrogance or fear or something else. It could be something self-centered. Um, so there's lots of reasons why it doesn't work very well. But trying to explain exactly what makes it work well is hard <laughs> because these are these are you know constructs in consciousness. These are mental constructs. And to try to explain to somebody who's never experienced that mental construct what that's like, it's just really, really hard to explain it. And I'm going all beating all around the bush trying to say it in words that hopefully if you put them all together, you know, it will mean something to you. But, you know, you say things, well, it has to come from the heart. Well, what does that mean? That just means you really, really want it. You know, it could come from the heart and be really full of ego. Mm -hmm. But that's not really what we mean. So none of, none of my explanations are going to be perfect and tell you exactly what it is. You have to experience it. Right. Like all things of mind. If it's not in your experience, then you can't understand somebody else explaining it. It has to be part of your experience. And then when it is part of your experience, you know exactly what they're talking about. Oh, yeah, right. Yeah, that's right. And it all makes perfect sense. So to get from that place where it's not part of your experience to that place where it is, takes a little bit of fumbling around, a little bit of trying, not expecting anything. Expectations are not good. You know, that's part of your ego is you expect something to happen or a particular thing to happen. By a certain time and <laughs> you know, by a certain it has to time look like this. <laughs> yeah. All of all of that, yeah, is not good. It'll happen. Things happen in their own way. Things manifest in in just the way they choose and the way they are, the way they do. Trying to make it happen just exactly the way you want it to is a mistake. Now you're putting energy into the wrong thing. Yeah. You're, you're putting energy into getting what you want rather than, you know, into actually healing the person. The, her, the person will know how to heal. You just have to put some extra energy into that healing process with your intention. So your intention has to be for the right reason. You want to be helpful. You care. You have love and caring and compassion. Okay, those are the right reasons. It has to be in the right way, and that is 
you don't have a lot of preconceived notions about what's going to happen other than the person will get better. You know, that, that they will begin to heal and they will begin to feel better or they will, you know, feel better, whatever it is you're trying to accomplish. But let that accomplishment of that thing take, take place in its own way and in its own form. You don't have to be specific about that. You're better off to let that happen the way that is natural for that person to have it happen. Okay. Now, you also need to have your intention very tightly focused so that you don't have six or seven things going on in your mind at the same time. Not only at the same time, but even at similar times. You know, if you start to think, okay, I really want to, you know, help my dear Uncle Fred, you know, who's not feeling well. And he said, oh, yeah, I wonder what. I wonder if he got my Christmas present yet. Oh, yeah, that reminds me. I haven't gotten the presents for, you know, my two cousins. And, you know, people's minds just tend to zing around all the time. It's just the way we are. Well, it's the way we are if we don't practice to be otherwise. But just an average person who's never practiced to be otherwise, their mind bounces around probably, you know, three or four things a second. Mm -hmm. Even things you're not even aware of. Your mind is bouncing from one thing to another to another. <clears throat> Sometimes people call that monkey mind, but that's probably not fair to monkeys. You know, it's, uh, <laughs> it's, it's just a mind that is not disciplined. And a normal mind is not disciplined. So you may have to practice for a few months, maybe even a year or so, to discipline your mind. Otherwise, your intent is not going to be strong because you'll have that intent for three seconds and then whoops, you're off thinking about this, and then you come back to your intent. Oh, whoops, you go off thinking about that. And that means you're not really serious about it. Because if you're really serious about it, that intent is strong. It's focused. There's nothing else going on inside your head. No other thought occurring. Not a feeling, nothing. Everything else is blank. You're not even aware of your surroundings, for that matter. Your surroundings drop away. You're not aware of your physical reality. It's just you, mind, focused on that you know, objective, that thing, for the right reasons. And you intensely want to help. You see? Now you put all of that together, and now you have a powerful intent that can, that can modify the future probability significantly. It doesn't mean that it will always work. Depends on how much probability you've got to move. If you start and it's a thousand to one that this is going to happen, you know, that person's going to get well, and you get it all the way down to a hundred to one, well, good for you. That's you put a lot of energy into it. But at a hundred and one, it's still not likely to happen. Right. You see? So it doesn't mean you get whatever you want. It just means you can influence the odds, you can influence the probability of an event happening. So where there is more uncertainty in whether that event can happen or not, then the easier it is to be effective. So if you're trying to do something, move something that's relatively certain and make it not happen, that's hard. If you're trying to do something that, well, you know, it could be this way, it could be that way, it could be another way, and you want it to be that way, well, that's relatively easy because it could be all sorts of ways. There's lots of room for it to move. In other words, the probability of it being that way is not going to be you know, terribly difficult to, to achieve because it could be that way or maybe not. So those are the kinds of things where you can be more effective. So it's not... You know, you should not be looking for miracles. You should be just looking to make a difference, whatever difference you can make. And the difference you can make is just whatever it is. Sometimes, if particularly if you're healing, you'll make no difference at all because, as it turns out, it's better for that person to have that illness. They've got something they're learning, something they need to learn from that illness. And they've created that illness, and now it's theirs to deal with it. That's happens sometimes. So you can work real hard and nothing much happens because you're you're trying to push a you know a heavy rock uphill. It's just not supposed to work that way. 
And even if you are very powerful and you force it to work that way and you heal them anyway, even though they need that, within a month or two, they'll get sick from something else and it'll go right back to the way it was. And, you know, you're not in the long term going to really hurt anybody or, or deflect them off their path for very long. They will return to that path because they put energy into that path every minute of every day. And you only put energy into it every time that you, you know, sit down and, and purposely, uh, you know, try to modify probability. Mm -hmm. So they are going to overpower you because you are more powerful towards yourself than you are to other, other people. You are supposed to be making good intentions for you for yourself. So anyway, that's just a little bit about intentions. I, I thought it'd be important to talk about that because it's confusing mm -hmm. to the people who have never actually experienced that kind of focus. Then, you know, they haven't developed the discipline of their mind to stay focused for a long period of time. And they haven't actually experienced that, that kind of can we call it, uh, you know, I could say a meditation state, but you don't have to meditate. It's just that state of being so completely focused on something that all of your surroundings disappear. You're no longer aware that you are here on this chair in this room or whatever. It's just your thoughts are all focused on this one thing entirely. Now, people go, you know, to meditation classes and they learn to meditate and they spend five or 10 years learning that discipline where they can do that easily and quickly. Well, that's that's one path. Another path would just be to start with your imagination and get to be so into what you're imagining that the rest of the world drops away. Well, that gets you to the same space. That puts you in a mental space right, where your mind is only doing what you're focused on doing. So whether you enter it through imagination or enter it through meditation really doesn't matter. Really doesn't matter. As a matter of fact, the way most people do is that they start through meditation. They get to the point that they can be very consistent most of the time and their meditations get shorter and shorter and more efficient and more effective so that instead of taking a half an hour to meditate, they can get in a good meditation state in about 10 seconds. No, they just get easier and easier. And then pretty soon they just kind of drop the meditation altogether and they just go there and do that. And that's really starting with your imagination. They don't really stop and meditate first because they can drop into a meditation state almost instantly. Right. But that's like five or 10 years later. You know, it doesn't usually start that way. It takes some time and some practice to do that. And that would make... I'm talking about a person who's really effective at modifying, you know, future probability. Most people are not. So intention. Another thing about intention is that it's cumulative. Mm -hmm. So if you just have this intention once, right. well, okay, you've, you've <laughs> like you've, you know, you've tapped it once, yeah. but if you have it again, then you've tapped it twice and it's additive. Those two taps are twice as effective as one. And if you do it a hundred times, let's say five or six times a day for a couple of weeks, right? That's five or six times seven, okay? So you're doing a 30, 35 times, something like that, you know, over a couple of weeks. Now you'll probably be much, much more effective in getting a result. As you get better, you can have the same result sooner more quickly because you learn to put more power to it. But in the beginning, if you're going to make a, a resolution or if you're going to use your intent for something, don't just say, well, I tried it once and it didn't work. You have to have that intent and have it and have it. Even if you only take 10 or 20 seconds out, you know, the time it takes you to get up, walk to the bathroom and, and walk back just in the time walking, you can put intention on that thing happening. You can get down deep inside yourself and feel that, what it is that you intend to do. Put some energy in it. It only takes seconds. You can do that five, six times a day if it only takes you know, your 20, 30 seconds. It doesn't take up a lot of your time. 
but you do it. You keep that in your mind. In other words, it, what you're intending stays in the back of your mind almost all the time. People who are real good at that, they have this stack of intentions back in their mind that they are, that basically are there constantly. They're pouring energy into them all the time. So it's cumulative. That means if you and 10 other people get together and all do this, and it, it doesn't have to be at the same time, just all do this, then you'll be approximately 10 times more strength in what you do because you have 10 people doing it. It's additive. And if you have 10 people doing it six or seven times a day, well, now you're really putting some energy out there into that. And if they're all doing it from the heart, if they're all doing it for good reasons, if they're all really positive, you can do some pretty large miracles with that kind of power. It's done all the time. You know, Donna of MBT, she runs a, a healing circle. <clears throat> and a lot of people get together, like 70, 80, 90. Sometimes she's had over 100 people. And you get 100 people put their minds together, even if two-thirds of them aren't all that strong individually. you got a pretty powerful intent going there. And it's done some pretty amazing things. Mm -hmm. It has some pretty amazing stories that go with uh, their successes. So that's what it is about intent. It has to be sincere. It needs to be focused. Your mind needs to be disciplined. It needs to be for the right reasons. And you have to do it often enough to be effective. So if what you want to do is lose weight or quit smoking or be a nicer person or stop being so negative or, you know, uh, something like that, well, think about it, you know, many times a day. Think, watch, watch what you're saying and, and, the, and the feelings that you have. If your feelings go negative, ah, notice it. Right. See, to be aware of it, change it. Not, not act over it. We're not, we're not trying to be better actors here. We say that a lot. You know, it's not like, oh, smile, even though you're angry. Mm. That's not helpful. That just suppresses it. And when you suppress it, it comes out later, even in a bigger, you know, you, you got a bigger thing to deal with later on because you've been suppressing it all this time until one day that's too much and it explodes. And now it's a, it's a worse thing. So don't suppress it. You have to Get rid of that negativity. I think that so, was one thing I forgot when I was going over this because it was somebody else's list. But I think the biggest thing with intentions is the more you focus on them. And then, as you say, looking at your feelings, um, you know, I think your fears start to come up. And glossing over your fears is not going to help, but actually looking and addressing your fears and seeing where you can you know, shift that, that's, that's probably the most important piece <laughs> because exactly. that's what intentions are going to do is that you're going to have these intentions, but if you didn't have fear, then you'd already have the things that you're wanting, or you'd already, you'd already be the kinder caring person, or you'd already stop smoking or you'd already. So there's the fears that are attached to all of our intentions that, that that's the piece we have to get to. <laughs> yes. It is. And that piece is, <clears throat> is often rooted in your childhood someplace. You know, just like quitting smoking. The reason that a lot of people smoke is because they want to be more important, more noticeable, more adult, because they associate smoking with being an adult, with being one of the power people, you <laughs> see. At one because time, I think the, it was. <laughs> because that's the way the ads all ran, right? That's the that's the way smoking was advertised. You know, cool people and and people who are with it, you know, they all smoke, and uh, you need to smoke too, so you can be with it. And we had all that sort of advertising going on. So five year olds and six year olds, they take all that in. You don't think they're paying attention, but they take every bit of that in. And then when they're, you know. 14 or 15 or 16, they want to smoke because in their mind, that's how you become somebody important. That's how you become an adult. So now they're smoking. Okay, now they're a, a nicotine addict. 
and they're thinking, oh, I really would like to quit. I should quit because it smells bad. You know, my wife doesn't like it. My husband doesn't like it, whatever. You know, it's my children don't like it. It's a nuisance and so on. But in the back of your mind someplace, there's this little thing that says, yes, but if you quit smoking, you won't be so important. You won't be more as adults. You'll be like a child. Your children aren't allowed to smoke. And you have that feeling. So it makes it really hard to quit. And you think, well, shoot, that was just some five-year-old being overcome by an advertisement. And you never think that that's the problem. But in many cases, that is the problem. It's that five-year-old's attitude that if they don't smoke, they'll be lesser somehow because they smoke to become more. And you want to become more because you're kind of insecure and not satisfied with who you are. So you see it builds on an insecurity. And then, you know, that's the fear at the root of it. It builds on the insecurity. And then it makes it very difficult to quit because you you know now intellectually you'd say, well, that's ridiculous. Quitting smoking would actually be better. You know, people would like me better. I'd smell better. You know, you can have all those things, but that's in the intellect. Down in the part, down in the you, down at your core, says, yeah, but I wouldn't be as important. I wouldn't be as significant. And though that is completely irrational, at the core of you, things don't have to be rational. <laughs> now, rationality isn't a thing at the core of you. It's just how you feel about things. And whether it's rational or not, you never notice. It's just the way you feel. So... You know, when you when you have these intentions, you also have to deal with your fears. It's just exactly what you were saying. That's the important thing. You have to look at it and look at, well, why not? What keeps me doing this? Is it just my addiction, my physical addiction? Or do I have an emotional addiction to it? Which is my addiction to, you know, I'm insecure. And this makes me feel more secure. Is that the problem? And if it is, how do I deal with that? No, well, that's something you want to change. So you start working on that insecurity and on the fact that the people who smoke are somehow bigger and better and more capable. Because, you know, in, back in the 50s and 60s, all the people in films who were the heroes and who, you know, were the, the smart detectives and all those people smoked. Smoking was what the smart people and the clever people did, the successful people, because that's, you know, the, the cigarette companies were, were the ones paying for those shows, you know, so that's the, that's the way it worked out. But I remember no... reading something it, <laughs> that originally cigarettes came out through the doctors because it was supposed to help for... Um, What's the childhood asthma? <laughs> oh, oh, yeah, like, oh my! <laughs> I'm sure that would be great for wrong. asthma. <laughs> yeah, right. Can you imagine. You got oh, asthma. Breathe yeah. some smoke. See how that helps. Yeah. <laughs> but anyhow, yes. But we don't realize. Now I'm just picking on cigarettes here or nicotine. But these same kinds of little things affect us throughout our life. When we're three and four and five and eight years old, we pick these things up. Tiny little things, things that now are, we look at them with our intellect and we'd say, well, it's totally irrational, but they're in our feelings. And a lot of our fears are based on these trivial things. A lot of the things we do that are dysfunctional are based on these simple little things we picked up as kids and we've never let go of. Our intellects aren't aware of them, but our feelings are, and they drive us because they are they're ensconced in our fear and they drive us because we're insecure and we we associate a lot of things with that insecurity that really have nothing to do with the insecurity so these are the things you know when you talk about getting ready to review these are the kind of things you have to pick apart mm -hmm. when you're when you're learning because you have to get rid of all that junk Otherwise, your thoughts, your intents will never be very strong and focused and powerful because it's all that junk that keeps them from being 
focused and powerful. It's all that junk that has your mind flitting around from this thought to that thought to this feeling. And you know, it's that stuff. So see, the whole thing ties together. In order to be good at this, with using your intent to modify future probability, you have to get rid of your fear. Mm. That's why it is people who are very negative and fearful can't really be very effective in doing this. So it's all part of the same thing. You know, the fear is the problem. Um, the, the getting over the fear has to be a lifetime project. You can't set it up and say, well, in the next six months, I'm going to, I'm going to, you know, change myself. Well, that's possible. It's not very likely, but it's possible. But you have to take the long view. I've got all the rest of my life to work on this and I should start now. <laughs> that's the, that's <laughs> the, that's the right attitude to have. I should start right now. And let's start right now with changing some of my behavior that I know is negative. I complain. I like complaining. I complain all the time. When my friends and I get together, we complain about our bosses. We complain about our work. We complain about our spouses. We complain about our children and what they're not doing right. And, you know, we tend to complain a lot. Well, that's negative. You got to let that go. Say positive things. Find positive things to say, and it'll make you a lot happier. Mm -hmm. you know, so just a simple thing like that. Just look at yourself and say, when's the last time I felt something negative? And for most people, that'll be probably less than you know, a half an hour ago. <laughs> that will be, you know, oh, just a few minutes ago. You know, it, it won't be very long. You know, and by negative, I don't mean, you know, angry. I mean, that could be one of them, but just annoyed, upset, uh, didn't like the way things were going on. So it just annoys you, it kind of rubs you the wrong direction, just something that, that's negative. So it, it doesn't have to be a big major explosion or anything. It just means that you don't like the way things are. That's negative. Positive is you're fine with the way things are. You don't have to love the way things are, but you're okay with the way things are. They don't bother you. They don't irritate you. You're not stressed over this or that. And this idea that, that you know, you wouldn't have any stresses at all if it weren't for other people. Other people give me stresses. My kids, my spouse, my boss, you know, my coworkers, everybody gives me stress. <laughs> well, that's not the case. They don't give you stress. You have stress around your interactions with those people, but the stress comes from you, not from them. And then you just trace each one of those stresses. Where do they come from? Why do you feel that way? And just learn just the way we said to overcome it. Have an intention. Keep that intent going all day long, multiple times a day, for multiple days and multiple weeks. And you know what? It'll go away. You'll, you'll beat it just because you have that intention to beat it will make it go away. So it's, it just takes resolve, I guess, to do it. So I think that's about as good a, you know, a prescription of how to, you know, how to get rid of fears, how to be effective in using your intent to modify future probability, you know, how to uh, have an, an intention, like a new year intention that uh, actually does something. Uh, you can't just make a wish, you know, whether you throw a penny or a dime in the wishing well or not. <laughs> Wishes don't work. You know, prayers that are all about you and what you want. You know, you're asking benefits. You're asking for boons, I guess is the right word. You know, boons, benefits uh, uh, from somebody else to fix something for you. Uh, that doesn't work. You've got to fix it yourself. And mainly what you're, well, always what you have to fix is you, which is convenient because there you are, you know, you, uh, you can't fix anyone else. So it's a good thing that everything you have to fix is you. So that's the thing about intent. Intent is not just wishing or wanting or having a preference and it's not just something that you do once. It's something you have to, you have to be it. 
You have to, you know, live with it. You have to be the intention. You have to keep it in your mind. You have to actually really want to do it. And it has to not be about behavior. It has to be about you, who you are. Not just behaving better. If all you're trying to do is change your behavior, well, there's lots of ways to do that. You know, you can change behavior of somebody just with rewards and punishments as a behavior changer. That's not what we're trying to do. Changing behavior is civilizing, but it doesn't help you grow up any. Mm-hmm. You're still carrying all the same miserable stuff around with you. You just <laughs> behave better. Yeah, well, that's, that's nice, but it's not, not where you want to go. Or you got your willpower to do it, and it didn't change from the inside. It just changed. You just got your willpower to do it. A lot of people you know, rely on their willpower to help them. There's too many things that, I mean, willpower is, you need it, but you have to be with it. <laughs> you have to be one with it. You have to be, oh, very zen. <laughs> but, you, you know, you have, it can't just be willpower because willpower will only take you so far. That's usually what happens is that, you know, we get, oh, really strong willpower at the beginning of the year to do this and this and this. And then, you know. Lesson. Well, then two days later, yeah. it's just a little <laughs> tiny bit of willpower, and a week later, there's no willpower in it at all. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's not consistent, doesn't last long enough, yeah. doesn't actually come from the heart, often comes from the intellect. I should quit smoking. I should, you know, not be so negative. And if you're trying to change your behavior, again, it, it, uh, it probably won't be successful. But even if it is, it really is not going to help you be any happier. There was a terrible book out there, and I'm not going to say too much about it because it, she was very popular. But one of the things it was it was a weight loss. It was re- actually about stopping sugar, which is a good thing. But she actually said to tape your mouth while you're cooking <laughs> so <laughs> that you, you don't taste that you should have it. You know, it's like, oh, my you can't possibly <laughs> think that's a good thing. <laughs> Can you imagine? Hmm. Yeah. Well, that would work, I guess, if you kept it taped forever. <laughs> mm. so, no. That would be well. Yeah, that's well. Taping your mouth is is behavior modification, right? Yeah. It will it that's will change your behavior because you no longer can put anything in your <laughs> mouth. So it's it's that falls in the behavior modification, but it doesn't help you grow up or change <laughs> anything. Yeah. yeah. It's a it's a. Uh, kind of an empty gesture but if the whole reason you're overweight is because you sample while you cook (laughs) yeah right (laughs) yeah yeah, okay get it go get this the uh what is it duct tape right Uh, (laughs) change your habit if it's just a habit then uh, i suspect some duct tape would help you change your habit pretty quickly that would be so uncomfortable particularly tearing it off again at the end yes That would be a real stick. You know, talk about carrots and sticks. I guess if you did it overnight, you'd stop snoring. <laughs> well, they have devices for that. They do, yeah. they do have devices for that. Maybe a little Not less uh, <laughs> yeah. less painful. <laughs> they have ways, you know, force people to breathe through their nose rather than through <laughs> the mouth, and then they don't snore so much. Mm. Yeah, some things we think of. <laughs> But yeah, behavior modification. But if it doesn't come from the heart, if it doesn't, and I don't know how that could possibly come from the heart because it sounds like it's completely fear-based. So, (laughs) but yeah. Well, things that are fear-based, you know, don't last. Or if it's it's like the whack-a-mole, you know, as soon as you knock one down and something else pops up, that fear is going to manifest itself some way. It's there. If you don't get rid of it, it will manifest in some way. And even if you're able to make it not manifest this way, it's going to come back out in some other way that it will manifest. Mm -hmm. So when you have the fear, you have the fear. And that fear will trouble you. Maybe it doesn't show as much, but it's going to be just as damaging to you and to your life as it was in the other form, mm-hmm. fears just by shoving them under the rug and so they don't show is not 
is not uh, going to help you grow up. It'll just drive you crazy. Mm-hmm. And by the end, you know, by the end of your being able to stuff it under the rug, you will be resentful. Yeah. I did all these things for all those people. And what have they done for me? That's the person who grit their teeth and forced themselves to wash the dishes or do whatever they didn't want to do, but they did it anyway. You know, well, then they get very resentful after a while. And all of that, that uh, anger they had, okay, they suppressed it for 10 years, maybe. But eventually, it it blows up. And when it does, it's a lot worse. Hmm. It causes more damage and more hurt and a lot worse than if they had not suppressed it. Hmm. Better just to deal with things than try to suppress them. And there's there's if you just ignore a fear, it does not go away. You actually have to get rid of it, hmm. not suppress it. And That's changing important. your perspective, obviously. Because there's, we can find meditation or heart centeredness in anything we do. We could do the dishes from a loving, kind place because it's who we are. But you're right. If we start to resent it or we were doing it for all the wrong reasons, then that's, you know, then that makes it an obligation that people don't, that start resentment yeah yeah that's a uh, that is a problem that's even worse and that's often you will see elderly people Mm. and maybe mostly women because they live longer than men you know the, the old people you see walking around tend to mostly be females because the old people have already died uh they tend to die two or three, four or five years younger than, than females. But in any case, you, you see people who are older and they just have a real sour expression. And when you talk to them, all they want to tell you about is everything that hurts and all the things that's wrong with their life. And, you know, it's all about their pain. And you can just see that's what it's like. You're not You're not very happy if you live that way it's just and it's just a change of perspective i mean i mean it sounds hard oh reach down inside of you and grab your fears and rip them out oh that's such a hard thing to do but all you do is just change your perspective mm-hmm. now here's here's a, a simple example you know i i always tell people that what life the way life works is that stuff happens and you get to deal with it and it doesn't really matter so much what the stuff is that happens. What matters is how you deal with it. That's what's important. You deal with it with love, with caring, you know, with the low entropy uh, solutions is how you deal with it. So if you just change that perspective from what matters is what happens, Hmm. and then I'll deal with it, you know, however I have to. But what matters is what happens. Now, if what matters is what happens, now every time a change comes along in your life, you've got fear. Because how am I going to manipulate this change to come out the way I want it? Everything, every relationship, everything you do, everything you approach, your job, your kids, it's all about how can you manipulate it to come out the way you want. Your life is full of manipulation. It's full of insincerity. It's, it's, it's full of, uh, what anguish because it doesn't work your manipulations of people just go so far i know everybody thinks they're very clever in their manipulations and it does work occasionally particularly if the children are less than eight years old you can manipulate them and sometimes when they're very young it's better to manipulate that's fine all right this toy's broken but look at this shiny toy you know and you try to distract them and that's a manipulation but when they're real young that's okay but when people are old enough to be in control with their own free will, then manipulation isn't a good thing and people don't like it. It doesn't, it doesn't feel right. But so that's just a perspective. The perspective is what matters is what happens. I want it to happen the way I want it. Or it doesn't really matter what happens. What matters is how I deal with it. You see, just a different viewpoint. 
and it changed your life completely. Just you do nothing more than change that perspective. That life, however it happens, is okay. I'll deal with it, and I'll deal with it positively. If it's my, you know, if it falls to me to wash the dishes every darn night, because that's just the way it is, I'll deal with that, and I'll deal with it positively. Because I know it's a task that needs to be done, and I'm doing a service to my family to do it. And that'll be that. You know, you do it positively. You don't say, well, I'm I'm giving more than I'm getting, and that's not fair. <laughs> you know, that's a perspective that just creates trouble. That doesn't, it's not helpful at all. That's just trouble. So just by changing your perspective, the way you look at something, the way you assess it, the way you judge it, can change your whole life in just a simple shift of perspective. Mm -hmm. Well, that will require you to shift your perspective. You'll probably have to become less self-centered because when you're self-centered, you need things to be the way you want them, the way they should be. You know, of course, that's the there's only two ways to do things: my way and the wrong way. You know, <laughs> that's where that that's where that attitude comes from. So. Mm -hmm you'll probably find that you're self-centered and that's the reason you have that perspective. But then you have to work on that. Saying, I need to get rid of my self-centeredness. I need to not lead everything by assessing how that will affect me and how can I arrange it such it affects me the way I want. Mm -hmm. Instead of seeing life that way, you need to assess it. How can I help? How can I be part of the solution? And when you do that, you help everybody up around everybody around you. Well, you'll help them grow up too. You'll help them grow up too. Because if you fuss about doing those dishes every night because it's just not fair, then nobody is going to ever bring it up because you'll you'll blast off if anybody even brings it up. But if you just do the dishes, now there's a probability it's just gone up that somebody in your family will think, you know, mom does the dishes every night. You know, maybe I should help. <laughs> maybe I should do them tonight. You know, give her a break. So you 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 help other people grow and make better decisions by you making better decisions. Now that may take a year before somebody comes to that conclusion, but that's okay. You got all the time in the world. You're helping people grow up by being grown up yourself. So if you want to help others grow up, grow yourself up first. And you be grown because that gives them an environment to grow up, a better environment for them to grow up in. They're more likely to realize things when they see somebody who's doing things for the right reasons. So it all works. <laughs> it all works together. And the key thing in all of this is intention. It's all about intention. I intend to grow up. I intend to not be so self-centered. I intend to keep my intention in my mind strong, you know, every day for the next, you know, multiple times a day, every day for the next six months until I succeed. You know, that, that's intention. And if your intention is this year is or for next year to grow up just know that that might take a little bit longer <laughs> if you get upset because you haven't grown up yet just uh, <laughs> and it's not aware. working <laughs> well, yeah. yeah it's probably yeah <laughs> it's a long yeah again i guess the other thing that's really important another another uh just a, a perspective is that look for the long term yeah uh, we're in we're in it for the long term not for the short term we're in it for the lifetime. Yeah. You've got an entire lifetime to grow up. That's your job. That's why you're here. And you, you know, you start whenever you start and you get as much done as you can get done. And then you get another lifetime to go on from there. Yeah. So you have to look at it in the long view and not expect to change yourself in a week. Now, sometimes people do change in a week, but that's only because they're ready to change. They've gotten themselves really, really close to seeing that bigger picture, really, really understanding it. They're right on the edge of it. And then something pushes over the edge and bingo, within a week they go from, 
you know, self-centered or not self-centered. That happens, but only because they've done all the work over the last decade previously to get to that point that they're ready. So it's if you if you hear about people who suddenly, you know, they were bums and alcoholics and didn't do anything, and now they're, you know, they're 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 brilliant uh, prophets and and philosophers. Uh, well, it didn't just happen like that. It's because they've been working on the concepts and on the attitudes for a long, long time, and maybe over many lifetimes, and it finally just hit. You know, the the, the last straw just fell into place, and then everything clicked. And they got it. So sometimes you get that aha moment and things get clear. But mostly it's just a long, slow bunch of little increments, tiny little increments, a little bit of progress here, and there's a little bit more progress. And you don't even notice it until you look back. And you look back and say, who was I five years ago? What was I like? Where was I five years ago? And what was I doing? And then you see the difference and it's like, oh my goodness, how much I have changed. <laughs> but you don't notice it in the process because it's just thousands of tiny little choices yeah. that you make every day. Every little choice that you make. And, and you do, you make thousands of them in a day. The way you react, the way you respond, the face you put on, whether it's a smile or a frown. You know, these are all little choices yeah. that, that you make. Whether you do a task you know, with with uh, positivity or whether you do it, you know, because you feel like you have to and you're forced and you grumble. You know, just those little choices add up to make a huge difference over time. So nothing drastic really has to change. It's just a slow process of when when you have that will to change, that intention to change, then you will. You will change, but it, it may be slow, but you will change. That's all it takes is that intention. Yeah. Intention is the motive force within consciousness. That's what makes things change and move in consciousness is intention. So that's a good subject to talk about. When you talk <laughs> about intention, you talk about everything. You know, that's like the at the root of, of everything we do is that, that intention. All right. Well, that was a great show. And I think we all have a little bit more to go for with our next year. <laughs> Intention. All right. Well, I... I hope people got a little better perspective of that word because it is a confusing word, it is. particularly for people who've not been on this path very long and are just starting out. And you just have to kind of struggle with it a bit until you begin to to get it. Yeah. All right, you've been listening to News of the Heart. We've been getting the heart of what matters with Tom Campbell and intentions. All right, so, well, we'll be back next year. <laughs> yeah, next year. So thank you, Lori. Oh, I, appreciate, you. Uh, I appreciate you uh, talking to me every month. And I love having you, and everybody else loves listening to us, so we're good. <laughs> good. All right, <laughs> we'll be back next year no i like saying that <laughs> okay so next year next january year. the last tuesday in january there you go <laughs> all right it's a date it's a date thanks tom <laughs>